We're going to be talking about three things this morning. Annoyance, which is due to the oil noise. We're going to be talking about sleep interference, how noise affects your sleep. And we're also going to be talking about what we call infrasounds. We're going to talk about health effects. Transportation noise. Noise from trains, from cars, roadways. The number that's re recommended is the number. It's 55 dB. And one of the things we take into account in noise assessment is the nature of the community. And Richardson is not like Manhattan, Kansas. There's a big difference. And there's an even bigger difference between Manhattan, Kansas and Manhattan, New York. And so in flying areas and rural areas, we have to lessen the criteria by 10 dB. The wind turbine companies are saying that a weighting, which is what we use for transportation noise, should be used for the wind turbines. A weightings take on a lot of the low and high frequencies. But a wind turbine is what we say is something that's strong and low frequency content. Because both the ISO and ANSI standard say that a weighting should not be used. The wind farms are not complying with the standards. Specifically, ISO, the ISO, the International Standard for Environmental Rules, contains the following. For assessment of sound with strong low frequency content, the rating procedure should be modified, the measurement location may be changed, and the frequency weighting is affected since sound with strong low frequency content is under greater annoyance than is predicted by the A-weighted sound pressure level. More so, because you have a somewhat impulse-like character, you get this pulse, these times the blade passes the state of the pole. Uh, you get this thumping sound, which is somewhat impulsive. So an alternative metric for A-weighting is required, and this is something the pulse has to be looked at, it's never been looked at. So there's two problems there. These two factors together mean that, like airplanes, we said were 15, 5 dB more annoying than road traffic, it means that there should be an adjustment for the thumping and an adjustment for using a weight. And those two together are. At least 5 to 15 dB. Quiet rural setting requires an adjustment, and the standards say up to 10 dB. So the adjustment should be 10 to 25 dB. So the 55 dB, if we use that as the criteria for traffic noise, we have to subtract 10 to 25 dB from that, which says that. DNF should be between 30 and 45 dB. So I come up with the highest that number should be is 39 dB. And the lowest would be about 24 dB. And I think what they're proposing is 50 or 55. So they're proposing something that's two to three times louder than it should be. My conclusion is that with the Cooper study, the preponderance of the evidence is that infrasound causes the adverse effects in some people. Industry provides no proof that the wind turbine acoustic emissions are not causing the adverse effects. Public officials should require this proof before approving the wind turbines. Thank you.
I've done also reviewed the reported impacts, nuisance factors, and uh, stigmas that are typically associated with nearby wind projects. Uh, and these are established by example um, at existing residential and ag uses when wind turbines are introduced into the community. Uh, and then I've reviewed my own studies, which I've done several, and other studies prepared by others, some of which are independent, and some of which I classify as industry studies. Briefly, the SARC Comprehensive Plan has a goal to ensure that uh, the land uses are compatible with adjacent land uses. I don't know how you can put 40 two story structures uh, surrounding homes uh, and somehow achieve that kind of compatibility, but uh, I imagine you might hear some descriptions of uh, turbine towers that are painted white so they blend into the sky. If that's compatibility, then I stand corrected, but I don't think that achieves that in reality. Uh, there's also objectives to ensure orderly development, even for uh, desirable energy development, which uh, Oftentimes, desirable energy development is considered some combination of all of the above. And I understand that Sarp County has already done quite a bit to contribute to Sarp, uh, to, to your obligations of the all of the above with the, with the oil and the, and the, the bio plant and so forth. So, uh, you know, adding another mix of energy generation that takes up 64 square miles uh, really does kind of prevent an orderly development of. Uh, ongoing development in the county. Um, also important that the land use plan uh, requires that uh, conflicts between land uses be avoided, um, which is heard from Dr. Schumer uh, in, in a nutshell, is that there are often conflicts with land uses and people that are living residential properties or other sets of properties like nursing homes, schools. Part of the way Star County plans to implement the strategies and goals is uh, prohibition of spot zoning and uh, prohibition of uses that depreciate land values and adjacent properties. Um, the spot zoning issue uh, is, uh, can be understood as uh, is usually an odds with the system's master plan and current zoning restrictions. So there's higher restrictions in Star County for really any other land use. And, uh, when developers don't like to talk about high restrictions that exist in your existing zoning ordinance because they never want to build something that is 39 feet tall. They want to build 439 feet tall or thereabouts. Uh, spot zoning also makes unjustified exceptions for parcel or parcels in a district. So it doesn't have to just be one property. It can be any number of parcels. There are half cats related to shutter board together. They're signing leases that end up leaving properties in the mix, surrounding the development footprint, and overlaying with an industrial uh, character of these turbines. And, uh, <coughs> I don't quite understand what I mean, but just go out the daytime or nighttime with any existing project and just sit still for a while. And uh, as long as the wind is blowing, you're seeing these turbines spinning, and that's really something else because uh, uh, those FAA lights uh, can be very ominous and uh, I've heard likened to a fleet of UFOs landing in an area because it's just uh, such a, uh, a vivid change to the uh, night sky. Um, um, this could also, uh, spot zoning can be an unjustified special treatment when it's a particular owner or in case of parcels, multiple parcels of being some turbines uh, of particular owners while undermining pre-existing rights and uses of adjacent property owners. Uh, the uh, next area has a site at uh, this uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln uh, study that is describing the fiscal impact in exclusively positive terms, but uh, uh, they do state in their report that uh, it would be helpful if, they, if communities have a realistic understanding of the likely effects of wind energy projects. I mean that capital uh, they didn't uh, call attention to that, just so you know. Uh, but the, the, the University of Nebraska, excuse me, North Dakota, um, offers the only trust the part of the fiscal impact but fail to consider the property value impact, even though that is one of the requirements that uh, must be met under condition of use zoning uh, in order to get the, the project approved. Um, 
condition and use permits of South County and uh, review your local ordinance. And the, the ordinance is based on the division of the county and the districts within which the use of land buildings are usually compatible. Again, it's very difficult to make turbines of this scale and the size and density and intensity. And by that, I mean 400 or something feet tall, running 24 7, building them too close to homes. Uh, and, and all the issues that they just can't be together. Um, uh, there might be some restrictions that could be put on that would start bringing it towards that if, uh, if the county uh, chose to pursue that goal of somehow trying to make it work. And I'll talk about some possible restrictions or conditions that could be imposed uh, by the county board or the zoning board if they so choose. Um, and uh, that's where I'm sorry to tell you this in the code, they, uh, they, the commission may stipulate the conditions and restrictions. It's not just me saying I think they can. The ordinance says they can. Uh, so I think that's a an important thing to keep in mind when uh, looking at the zoning process this you know, the paper will be coming up. Um, and no conditional use permit can be recommended by the planning and zoning commission to the county board uh, unless it meets uh, certain criteria. And part of that uh, is the health, safety, comfort, and general welfare, which I think a lot of that was from Dr. Schoen was just talking about uh, the health. Uh, if people are getting seasick from having to be surrounded by turbines, that's certainly uh, work against that notion. Uh, comfort, general welfare, because uh, if you woke it up in the middle of the night, uh, I think that works against comfort, general welfare. Uh, um, and uh, another condition is that the uh, proposed condition of use cannot substantially impair or diminish the value and enjoyment of a property in the area. The value is one issue, and enjoyment is another. Um, uh, but uh, the market value of the property is what I trust the most, but I'm well aware of, uh, again, numerous sworn testimony and uh, written complaints and so forth that affidavits. Where people have described their loss of enjoyment of their property, and uh, when I've done some very empirical objective studies as to what actually happens with the property values. Um, what might be particularly relevant also in this particular corridor of Sark County is that condition of use uh, shall not, not, might not, shall not impede the normal orderly development of the surrounding property. There's been 30 some building permits a year over the last few years, as I understand, uh, in this quarter that the project is proposed. Probably what you need to do is ask yourself if uh, you look at the building new house and you put it amongst 87 turbines, which look for another place to build your house, and that's how the market's going to react to it. What is the cost of value loss uh, when it occurs? That's uh, the real estate profession, the appraisal profession. Has many treatises and textbooks that describe detrimental conditions. That can include anything from airport noise to contamination on the property uh, to uh, locally undesirable land uses, uh, that can include power plants, prison, landfill, uh, things of that nature. Uh, the impairment of the quiet use and enjoyment of the property is also something that, that can cause any loss. It's an extraordinary motivation for people to sell property and sell them at a discount, providing that there's some known nuisance in the area, uh, and if you try to market your property at the price it should sell for, um, I'll get into some of the numbers in a little bit, but what you'll end up finding is that very often uh, those marketing periods just go on and on and on to reduce the price to fire sale or foreclosure type prices. Uh, health impacts uh, a certain detriment to, uh, to uh, people's perception of the area, aesthetics. Um, I was in Vermont on another, uh, actually this is a federal case, but uh, speaking to a broker out there, very consistent, many I've spoken to over the years, property seven miles from Mount Turbine, Slaughter Bridge. You can see them from the property, you can see them you know, see across the valley on the bridge. Uh, but as this broker pointed out, uh, all people have to do is get out to that area and then not a single offer after a couple of years on the market. And this is a beautiful life site, it's not a property. You know, um, in an uh, area that has no other uh, detrimental uses of it. But that all that creates a stigma or market resistance uh, and any of these issues by themselves can collectively and pretty much ensures that 
So any trespass or intrusion of excessive noise, contaminants, odor, vibration, glare, flicker, or physical impacts into, through, or over neighboring property, all these things set the stage for the value loss. Uh, stigma, by definition of a particular court case, is a, a constitutes damage to the reputation of realty. Now here's the meat of what I really heard talking about is the property value studies. There's independent studies that I've done, a few other independent professional appraisers, and then industry studies, uh, which are often funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, this is a report you can get off the internet. Many authors have had a moment of sometimes the developers are bringing uh, Mark Thayer, a professor from San Diego University, to uh, testify how their statistical analysis shows that there is no impact on property values. But I will tell you that if you go to page five of that report, you'll see that they built in an assumption into that study that the impact of wind turbines would not be greater than 4%. From where I stand as a trader, the frequency and outcome of the study is just absolutely the wrong way to go. Uh, it's not likely to find whether or not there is any bad impact if we start with that assumption. <coughs> um, well, uh, there are some people that have uh, high academic credentials that have worked on that study. Uh, um, and none of them are appraisers that follow appropriate appraisal standards in the appraisal business. In order to have an appraisal license, you have to conform to what's called the Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice, uh, um, and it's short of use gap. Uh, and uh, the, the, their study was even come close to meeting uh, the requirements of use gap. Uh, that might not mean a lot to go all that uh, It also doesn't address or meet the start county zoning code uh, regarding value of impacts. Um, because the best the study claims that it can only explain 64% of the variation in the sales prices in these multiple locations that they study, and they pulled all this data together. And it's a very fancy report, very impressive looking tables and charts and exhibits, and uh, they can't statistically find the impact is less than 36%. So property values have been impacted for 25%. Their report says, well, statistically, there's no impact, or it's equivalent to zero, they have said. Um, even if there's 25% impact, that's statistically zero somehow. Part of what that study did show uh, is that when you look at the vistas of the property, and this is particularly relevant here in Stark County, um, there's beautiful little scenic vistas, uh, that if you have a premium vista, it sells for 13% above an average vista, which is that center column. And just a somewhat above average vista, it sells 10% premium. But when you get a poor vista, that's 21% less average sale price than the reference category you got with an average vista. So if you started off with a premium vista and ended up with a poor vista, what that really translates into just by their own study, by their own numbers, is a 34% swing in the money. How realistic is that? Here's an example of a property in Michigan that, uh, uh, that turbine is 1,139 feet. Beyond that house, it looks like it's growing out of the roof, it doesn't. It's not trick photography, that's just standing uphill from it. Now, back in June 2011, I appraised that property $260,000 using comps that were from the area that didn't have any influence from the turbines. Long story short, between the time I appraised that property and the time I finally sold it, the market overall had gone 15%. The new one was worth $260,000. Uh, in June 2011, adjusting that by that 15% or $39,000 increase, it means what well, that property should have been worth when it finally sold was 299000 But it actually sold for one eighty or $119,000 less than what a very straightforward uh, <coughs> analysis showed the property should have sold for. That's just under 40% value of the government. That's just uh, what the industry would call a uh, the wind industry that is uh, like to refer to as an anecdotal piece of information. All this is on sale, it doesn't make the market. We'll get into some more of that. There's a, there are some appropriate appraisal methodology for determining uh, value diminution using what you might call the scientific method. It's a very empirical, it's very objective, uh, and taking opinions into account and using a larger volume of data when it's available. Some of those examples of uh, appropriate type of methodology include sale and resale analysis. 
when base loans were higher the second time, how much higher or how much lower, what was the rest of the market doing, and at that same time, uh, Paris Hill analysis, that's a little more straightforward, what maybe you all had a, your house appraised in the Sneaky Mountains, but a kind of a quick walkthrough when you made some notes and then they wrote a form report, and when they used some comparable sales, they made adjustments to those comparable sales based on the differences with the your property appears with it had three bedrooms and two baths and a, uh, and a, um, it used a comp to try to reflect that, but uh, otherwise they had to adjust that comp for any differences uh, to get it to balance out for the people as your property is. Industry likes to use, when industry does, likes to use regression studies, which are, again, uh, a statistical analysis. It can be useful for mass appraisal if you're using all the relevant data. Uh, but it's still there's certain benchmarks that have to be hit in order for a study like that to be considered reliable. And the uh, excuse me, International Association of Assessment Officials, that standard is an R squared or coefficient of determination for those that are statistically inclined of, a, of at least 0.9. So the study doesn't have 90% or better explanatory power uh, in a fairly homogeneous community. Uh, it's not considered reliable. And again, that Berkeley study uh, that the uh, plan shows no kind of impact only at 0.64 R squared. Um, just a February, I finished a study in the home state of Illinois. Um, this is Livingston County. It was a pretty good opportunity uh, to do it and be a site from there. Is the uh, Kyle Ridge market, you see those red dots are turbines. Pleasant Ridge is the turbine project that was proposed. Uh, out of the edge of the county line and also overlapping into the neighboring counties of Monongo and Farm. And on the top crop in Grant Ridge, also in the adjoining county line, was top crop partially in Livingston County, not partially in Livingston County. I think the lesson maybe you should be aware of here is that once one project gets approved in a county, it sends out the bad signal to the rest of the wind developers that this is friendly. Community and develop wind turbines. If that's what you all want. That's what you should do is approve one and they will follow, will it? They will come with a true standing to, uh, to, to the wind uh, energy industry. Uh, but in that site, again, we've got the balloons with the turbines. I'm not sure you can see them here. I'll try to point them out. There's green balloons are property sales. And the reason there's so few sales is because this is only a several year period of time uh, leading up to when I concluded the study, but once uh, uh, those projects went online. And uh, also, those green balloons are properties within three miles of any turbine. What I found is before we make any adjustments, is that they're $27.65 a square foot lower in the uh, target area. 25%. And in the marketing times, uh, while that wasn't real significant in that particular example, uh, part of the reason I think was that the multiple listing service there was not tracking the cumulative days on the market. Um, so I didn't have the opportunity to check that as to how many times the property had been listed, what its total marketing time was. But bottom line, it seemed like you make adjustments for the differences uh, of you know, basin finishes and lot size and the things that would make a difference in getting otherwise, we still have about 27 uh, and a quarter percent lower values than three miles of the turbines. Uh, what I also did was look at that data to see if there was anything to the rumors and claims and the reality as it turns out that there's people that abandoned their homes uh, near turbines. And there were, were about 151 sales in the control area, which is the rural residential area of Livingston County, outside the cities and towns, not near any land or any other so called new so just properties that were much like those near the turbines, you know, before the turbines were built. But what I found was that uh, um, the target area for the turbines, nine of the 30 total property sales uh, had sold the foreclosure, which means when people just turned into keys. 10%, 10.6% uh, in the control area. So three times the rate of foreclosure for no other good reason. Uh, and, and I don't them look for any other reason. Um, I knew that the, the, the prison closed, and uh, so it looked natural. Good. But all those people were in that prison, uh, first of all, I didn't move. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, there's no evidence of that. Uh, they weren't all living within three miles of turbines, so it was in the middle of the county. 
so that was just spread out everywhere. Um, I had done a study previously in 2009, uh, a little more simple and straightforward, just uh, uh, looking at a two mile distance in the Lee County uh, study that included the first project that was built in Illinois, it was called the Mendoza Hills Project. Uh, within two miles of the turbines, which are less than 400 feet, I think it was more than three and a quarter, um, the average sale price was $78 a square foot, $104. Uh, greater than two miles, which is a twenty-five dollar again per square foot difference, or twenty-five percent day diminution within two miles. I also done another study in two thousand twelve uh, that picked up where I left off in Lee County and expanded into DeKalb after next year I had built a project in DeKalb County. In that particular study, which is against trail county lines, me and DeKalb County uh, did detailed area sale analysis again. Uh, and target control sale data was selected on the basis of getting year of the turbines versus comparable sales, much greater difference. Now the target, the target sales averaged 2,618 feet, so about half a mile. Um, the control sales averaged over 10 miles away, which I think that was enough in the Calgary Lee County to pretty well block the view for the most part, for the most property, certainly far enough away that the, uh, the noise. Uh, down and presence wasn't there as it is to have it now. Um, this is in my whole study, this is just one example about like kind of properties, uh, a thousand feet from the nearest turbine, 11.7 miles from the nearest turbine, a few differences in finished basement and so forth, which have been adjusted for uh, when all is said and done. 43.8% lower value to the property in the turbine, um, which also had a 712 days on the market and had to go through three listings to uh, find it sold. So market times in the Lee County study area over uh, one and three quarter years near the turbines, 297 days uh, in the control room. Uh, DeKalb, very similar, 1.75 years, 232 days. Combine them both together, uh, it worked out to exactly one year longer near the turbines. Uh, and, and in Lee County, with the shorter turbines, there was still an impact ongoing. And I think that's relevant because of the wind industry's favor. The speakers will say, well, there might be a little nail gap when the project's announced, uh, but then after the turbines are up and running, the people get used to it, the property values soar and return to normal. Well, here it is. Uh, 2012, uh, nine years after those uh, Lee County turbines went up, and uh, still 22.5% lower values. That's uh, lower values. That's not soaring, that's continuing to sink. Um, the Cal County, where they built taller turbines, the 410 feet, I believe, uh, versus about 325. Uh, the value of that entire 32.8% above 33. My whole studies averaged. 26.4% of the turbines. So uh, the study results are the cumulative days of the market was one year longer in the turbines. The larger turbines uh, had a greater impact. Uh, uh, at least the curve results show that. Um, and uh, uh, my studies in lead to Cal, what is the county's like a consistent value of the curve? Uh, the range from 25 to 40%. And that's basically due to the adequate setbacks. Uh, there are some different uh, distances in there. Uh, we saw the Schindler example. To the, there's other similar examples in the study that show the closer it is, the, the more dominant the presence, the less marketable and less valuable the property is. I've done a little work in Ohio in 2012 also. Uh, very briefly, uh, in Worth County, uh, we were drilled up on the Blue Ridge Wind Project in the, in the Union and Oakland Townships. Red Stars are, they got a whole global realtor about all the sales that occurred since that project had been built, which is only one year at that point. Um, and also in townships, six miles away, that's six miles square of townships. Um, so in Liberty and York townships. And what I found was, uh, again, 26% uh, lower sale price uh, in townships with the turbines. And interestingly, in Union and Oakland, turbine townships, 
47 percent of those sales were by foreclosure, where I mean, the, uh, the ones that were uh, six miles at least were turned by uh, only nine percent by foreclosure. Um, this is a study I did not do, but a gentleman in Ontario, I know, did it. And what this is based on is Canadian Hydro had bought out uh, five properties that the ownership had complained to the wind developer, which is Canadian Hydro, bought a lot of packs and nuisance and noise and all these sort of standard things that come up uh, around these projects. Uh, the developer, I believe, has his heart bought out at the, uh, at the market day at that time. This appraiser, Ben Lansing, was able to track down what those original sale prices were at market value, so comparing to what else had been going on in, uh, in that county in Ontario uh, using development data. Uh, and the developer bought them out and then went on the market to resell them. And each and every case that they sold at a loss averaged 38.8% less, median 37% less. Now there was some time lag between when they bought off and they sold them, and then we had to get the time adjusted to those based on how much the market overall had uh, they had bought up between them individual sale dates. So uh, again, very properly controlled from a person perspective. Um, and at that higher rate, 38%, here's the takeaway from this, I think, is that each of these buyers knew what they were buying. They, 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 they were fully informed of those turbines were there because they could see them. But maybe even more important uh, is they had to bring it back to the window over an easement agreement that said uh, in exchange for buying this property, we're giving you this easement back over the property for noise, vibration, flicker, glare. And the, the, the buyer or the grantor of the easement acknowledges there may be an impact to living in the market. We say again, they acknowledge that there might be an impact to living in the market. And why is that important from an appraisal perspective? Well, this is a fully informed buyer. This isn't somebody that uh, uh, assumed this or was told that or a PR statement, you know, uh, that you know, has some weight behind it. It's just a claim. Uh, they, were, they were told flat out that uh, your living environment may very well be impacted by these types of impacts. Uh, and, they, and then when you have a fully informed buyer, there is your impact of close to 39%. In Ontario, all the assessment work, at least for residential properties, is done by a company called MPAC, Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. And, uh, and they did a study to try to determine a few things, whether or not their assessment levels, uh, the current level of assessment, which is represented by the blue bar, is in line with what the properties are actually selling for. And they did it by distance. Uh, this is within the one kilometer in this group, one to three kilometers, in this group, uh, three to five kilometers, and then outside five kilometers. And I don't know measure that, but I think five kilometers is about three miles. Um, and so outside three miles, we have average sale prices of 228000 in the shorter distances. Uh, you can see that they're consistently much lower, which this table is right out of there. Except I had the numbers, and we also had within, within one kilometer 279 sales, the next group 989, 3,000 sales in the next group, and those outside their uh, their three kilometers and their five kilometers is a 37,000 sales. So it's a pretty encompassing uh, research project. And here's a little bit bigger text. Uh, what it really translates to is that the you know, the median sale price in these different distances is a greater than five kilometer setback, it's a control setback. You can see the value of the at 25%, 26%, 21%, and three to five kilometer. Um, they weren't looking to find that. In fact, they stated in their study that there is no value of impact. Uh, but what they're really referring to is the way they measure that close are the recessions getting to the sale prices, not our market values declining closer to the turbines. So a um, little unintended consequence of your study, uh, I picked up on it, another gentleman or two I know uh, picked up on that. Uh, it's, I didn't make the numbers up, but they're their numbers. Um, my conclusions are that setbacks of less than three miles are inadequate 
Illinois significant loss of value or impair the appreciation of the neighboring property. If the minimum ordinance set back in Stark County that has allowed the most proximate residential properties will experience a range of value of 25 to 40 percent at those minimum and typically proposed setback rates. The minimum ordinance set back does not meet the requirements of the Stark County Zoning Ordinance with respect to the conditional use criteria regarding real estate value and compatibility related issues. And maybe common point for no one can tell you this, it's common sense. There's a marked resistance to buying a home in an overwhelming industrial setting that dominates the character of the area. In the case of sales of properties that are termed in Sludge or Auburn under duress due to the noise, the health impacts, the nuisance, and the invasion of their spaceship, the termite impacts. The discounts that are derived from the market in these termite studies are really pretty comparable to other duress conditions like foreclosure sales, liquidation sales, estate sales, you know, really short market periods, or trying to just sell really any other undesirable or problem property. I mentioned that you might have a few recommendations on some conditions that if the county should proceed with this and somehow try to find a way to work with the next owner or the next developer. And under the zoning code, as I understand it, they can impose conditions to approve a project subject to certain conditions. While heights are typically 400 to 500 feet as proposed for termites, wind energy can be generated with much less height, so it doesn't exclude termites by saying you can't build 400 foot termites. There's a couple of termites over by the Catholic, the monastery, thank you. I think I don't know if those will be about 125 feet, so if there's any precedent to start counting, that would be it. And it might be hard for us to say we're not going to let you build 125 feet, but maybe they should be hard for us to allow anybody to build anything taller than that in light of the impacts. Hours of operation, I always want to be able to run these things when the wind is blowing, but that's not always the best time for them to be operating near homes. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week is typically proposed, and they say that's what they need to make their project work. But that's not really Stark County's concern, that's their concern. And there can be hours of operation restriction. That could even include holidays, weekends, normal sleeping hours. That would probably kill the project, they wouldn't want to build it. But again, if they're going to try to fit into the community and be a good neighbor, then they've got to be aware of their impacts on their neighbors. Their new neighbors would say, no, we don't want to kick you out, but we don't want to ruin your barbecue or your Easter family get-together. The setbacks, the industry claims that you really only need to set back far enough so the thing tips over and won't hit your house. But even after a quarter mile, those setbacks just aren't enough to prevent the impacts like a shadow flicker, which many people experience as a very disturbing strobing effect while you're sitting at your breakfast table or your dinner table or your front porch in the evening. That's right when the turbine comes between the sun and you, and the blades are passing the sun. The closer you are to it, the more disturbing it is. I've seen some pretty god-awful effects like that at a much greater distance. You might still notice it, but not as a complete strobing effect. Temporary shutdown is a condition that could be imposed to prevent flicker. They like to say, well, the industry standard is that we get to put flicker on your property 30 hours a year. You should be okay with that, because they are. But that's not worthy. People buy properties are expecting to, again, have a strobing effect bombarding them for 30 hours a year without any ability to, when you close blinds, you're still going to see it. You can talk to them. They might want to plant a tree in front of your window. But again, why would you want to put a tree in front of your window when you used to be able to enjoy the view? So in my opinion, at least, if there is equipment out there that they can bolt into the project that will shut these turbines down and line up the properties to prevent flicker entirely. Not 30 hours a year, not one hour a year, not five minutes a year. Just that that's an interference with your use and enjoyment of the property. If this project were to be approved, 
I think that would be a perfectly fair condition. Um, another perfect condition, three words, when developers hit it, it's property that I can guarantee you. But the lead author of that 2009 OBNL study and the 2013 study was interviewed. And what kind of study, in case you can't read this, uh, is you might know about a property that I can guarantee. It's a dicey situation, it's complicated. But I think homes that are very close, there is just too much unknown right now. That seems reasonable. I think one of the things that often happens is that when developers put our report forward and say, look, property values aren't affected. And that's not what we would say specifically. But on the other hand, they have a little round stand on it if they said, you won't guarantee that. This is their author. I, I heard from them uh, pretty much at this point, this point only. Uh, but uh, uh, it makes sense with what my empirical studies and what the other independent studies have found. And it's contrary to how they try to present their conclusions. That's really about all I've got to say. As you can guess, about 1,400 megawatts of wind, and wind turbines installed. Initially, our state, which was trying to promote wind energy development, recommended 1,000 foot setbacks and 55 decibel noise limits. Um, it was just a recommendation, it was not binding. But the wind developers, of course, regularly touted it, including to me when I was on my local planning commission. What we've learned in Michigan is that it's been, we've experienced it's been a harsh teacher. Virtually every major wind development in the state is at litigation, referendum, recalls. Uh, a lot of people are suddenly being challenged in political primaries, um, lawsuits, abandoned homes. Uh, heritage uh, wind is just a small example of what's happened in Michigan. 14 turbines, 73 people have signed a uh, petition saying, can't you make the noise stop? It's now moved to the litigation stage. The township there is adopting uh, noise limits that will actually force the turbines to reduce their output, even though they're already in operation. They're applying additional regulations to them. What that really means is there's going to be extensive multi-year litigation coming in that community. The state of Michigan put together a report on renewable energy issues over the last few years, and they are now referencing in that document a, a, a paper uh, that says that perhaps mile and a quarter setbacks in uh, noise limits below 40 decibels in hilly terrain probably like you have here that would now be unheard. We've also learned in Michigan that wind is a poor environmental value. We've spent $3 billion on turbines. The most we could have reduced our carbon dioxide emissions, if that's a concern you happen to have, is maybe 6%. Had we built combined cycle gas turbines instead, we'd have already been able to close half of our coal plants. We could have reduced our CO2 statewide by 25% and find particular emissions and the other uh, criteria uh, emissions by 50% for the same price capital expense that we've already invested. That's why I believe wind energy is poor environmental value. That's what we are learning in Michigan. In MISO, which uh, North Dakota is part of, uh, I saw next year a reference to the Clean Power Plan that the Environmental Protection Agency has put out. And so MISO did an analysis of the building blocks um, that states are supposed to put in effect to uh, control the amount of CO2 that's being emitted. And you'll see wind energy is building block three. You can see that wind energy is by far the most expensive way to reduce CO2 under this plan, about $237 a ton. If you just build combined cycle gas turbines, you'll reduce CO2 for about $38 a ton. So wind does have some effect, but at a very high cost. I think that's a poor environmental value. What about land use? Here's a Fermi 2 reactor in Michigan, 1,100 megawatts of nuclear power. If you wanted to produce that same amount of energy on an annual basis from wind, you'd have to build turbines from Toledo to Detroit to Ann Arbor. There'd have to be two in every square mile inside that footprint. But you still have to build about 100 megawatts of gas fire generation because it turns out wind doesn't blow in July and August when demand is the highest. To put it another way, 36 square miles of this. You can produce that same amount of electricity with a semi-trailer mounted gas turbine that you can hide inside your average dairy barn. So let's get back to certainly zoning questions. I address those because they're often used as reasons to get people to turn a blind eye to some of the uh, negative effects that wind turbines might have if you want to regulate the zoning issues. Secondly, a lot of people will say, well, all you did was talk about the negative impacts about wind turbines. Well, it turns out that when you're writing zoning regulations, you don't need to regulate the positive impacts, right? Those are not the things that people need to be protected from. It's the negative impacts. There are benefits to wind development in your community. Primarily accrues to the wind developer and the leaseholders. That is what I've seen. I will also say that in the last six years of having been involved in communities like this, 
the most reliable thing about wind energy is the division it creates in the social structure of the community. So, what's it like to buy a wind turbine? If you've never had one before, we know how to evaluate the total cost of ownership for a new car or a new tractor. These are things we have a lot of experience with. But when a wind developer shows up and hears that we're going to build 86 or whatever the number is, there's some G1.7, there's some vessels V100s, we're now asking questions about things that most of us have very little experience with. So how tall is 476? I didn't see anything in your community 476 feet tall. But like we already referred to, we have an idea of what that looks like now. The new serpents are approaching 590 feet, 570 have been approved, I think, for next era in Michigan. And I consult with some people in Maryland where 690 foot are going to be built by Pioneer Green. Right now, I did not see any item for wind turbines in your existing zone. So what is our guide for proper land use policy? If you're an elected or appointed official and you're trying to make wise decisions about how you regulate any land use, then the things that you're going to need to understand and the words you need to keep in the front of your mind all the time are the words health, safety, and welfare. That's the sworn oath that we take as elected and appointed officials that as I exercise my appointed task, I will protect the health, safety, and welfare of the people in my community. And Stark County Zoning Ordinance says exactly that. The purpose of these regulations is to promote public health, safety, and general welfare, and as Mike Harvey referred to, the orderly development and to prevent conflict among land uses. Put another way, I would say that if the proposed activity cannot be formed in keeping with health, safety, and welfare, it should probably not be permitted. Developers of any kind, I don't care if it's a housing developer or an industrial plant developer, they're all interested in the same thing, return on investment, right? That's the recommendations are designed to bring maximum benefit that only stands to reason. I build new houses sometimes and sell them. Guess what? I, too, want to make sure that I can get the most money out of my investment. But the planning official's job is to focus on health, safety, and welfare. Uh, what are the limits? You'll hear a phrase thrown about if you attempt to adopt more strict zoning that the wind developers almost always say, well, this, that's exclusionary zoning. That's exclusionary. What you're doing makes it hard for me to do what I want to do in the fashion that I want to do it. Well, the limits of zoning are pretty clear. Uh, your zoning regulations must have a rational relationship to protecting health, safety, and welfare. If that's what your ordinance is doing, then it's really hard to challenge that in court. And that works both ways. If your community's adopted a very permissive wind energy ordinance, and you think that Dr. Schomer's right on the science, and in fact it turns out that he is, and your community got it wrong, they're not liable. Because they did the best they could with the information that they were presented with to them at that time. So it's very hard to challenge that. Likewise, if you adopt a very conservative ordinance, and you are, are preventing something from going forward, and your science was correct, the bottom line is you thought that it had a rational relationship protecting health, safety, and welfare. You have to have some finding of facts to put those things in place. It's difficult to challenge these things. Zoning is strong. And remember, we have to protect health, safety, and welfare, not health, safety, or welfare. A lot of times I see people say, well, yeah, it might screw up some people's lives, but we'll be able to get a new little league field with the tax revenue that comes in. Well, that, in my mind, is not a reasonable trade-off under the, the policy of health, safety, and welfare. Now, there's a lot of things we can talk about with wind energy. I'm only going to focus on a few height, setbacks, decommissioning, and noise. High limits. In general, my, my assumption, again, I did not study North Dakota law in deep detail, but that communities are free to regulate the height of structures simply on the basis of appearance. Wind turbines are no different than any other lawful use. You can restrict their size for the sake of appearance. Consider this Stark County regulates billboards. In fact, they say the purpose of regulating signs in the county is to provide for a visually pleasant environment and minimize potentially unsafe conditions while also offering opportunities for public and private information and advertising. If somebody had shown up and said, we're going to build 87 400 foot tall billboards across your entire county, then you won't mind them at all. We wouldn't even be here in this meeting room today, would we? Because nobody would say they want that. Well, are these devices different because they're 330 feet across and they spin and make noise and they flash a red light on top of them? And we know wind developers know they have impacts. Detroit Edison is one of Michigan's largest utilities. They build a lot of wind turbines. They, one of their executives said, look, there are some pristine places in Michigan where you don't want it to impact the you should. You take a situation like Lebanon County or the old Mission Peninsula here in our region, our region is the operative word, is the resort community where he happens to live. 
Certainly, there are areas where it would be just well to be perfect economic sense and perfect placement for utilities. We probably don't want them as a region there. So you wonder if the people here on county are happy with the fact that Detroit Edison has decided that their community is not unique or pristine. So the question is, how tall is too tall for your community? The good news is, like any other land use, it's up to you. But Vestas, the world's largest manufacturer, turned and said, look, if a runaway operation should occur, in other words, the roller continues to spin faster and faster because the brake mechanisms have failed, the plant must be evacuated immediately by running up wind and access to the surrounding area in a radius of at least 500 meters must be restricted at 1,640 feet. Nordex says the same thing. In case of a fire in the cell drop roller, parts may fall off the wind turbine. In case of a fire, nobody's permitted within a radius of 500 meters from the turbine. Well, in Michigan, what often happens is the developer is recommending 1,000 to 1,320 foot setbacks from their turbine to the home. Here you have a little bigger number. The 2,000 foot number is probably large enough to protect from fire and flying debris from roller damage. I think that is probably large enough to cover that. Um, but in this case, they recommend 1,000 or 1,320 feet from their turbine to your house. Even though the evacuation zone, in many cases, is 300 feet larger. You wonder if their employees are instructed to knock on your door on the way by and wake you up and say, hey, did you know the turbine is on fire? That's never put in any ordinances, but yet it seems that my house is now inside the evacuation zone. There must be some provision to protect me and my family. Even moving it back, however, and this is where it becomes very relevant with what you're doing here, if you move that safety setback back to your house foundation, the problem is that the two farmers now have an issue. This guy here, even though he's not signed a lease with the wind developer, can't build anything inside that semicircle anymore. He's donated his property to the neighboring property owner's tenant to be used as a safety easement. I don't think that's reasonable. By moving at minimum the physical danger zone back to the property line, at least this guy preserves all of his future development rights. In real life, and I think this is an next era term in Illinois, we see that the debris field was reported to be about 1,500 feet. There's a pretty good basis, in fact, that they know what they're talking about with the roller explosions and so forth. But that's a 390 foot class. <coughs> One of the things that we hear brought up a lot is people will say, and when I lean to the libertarian side of things myself, don't I have a right to do whatever I want with my own property? And in general, we all feel that way about our property, but we know there are limits. And Oliver Wendell Holmes was an associate justice in the United States Supreme Court. He said, look, the right to swing my fist and where the other man's nose begins. The things we do on our property, I want to have wide latitude in them until they can back my neighbor's ability to the free use and enjoyment of his property. That's reasonable. So what is the right setback distance? Well, if you're regulating setbacks to protect from fire or roller failure, 1,640 feet, or the way I would do it, is I would change that to a multiple of the turbine height instead of a fixed number because turbine sizes are changing all the time. Um, it might be enough for physical protection to set at least 1,640 feet to the property line. But, after hearing Dr. Schomer and Mr. McCann, if you're going to use setbacks as a proxy for noise limits, in other words, you say, we're not going to get into the noise measuring game, because i got to tell you, that's a hard one to prevail with in court, because you get six acoustic experts, and people's eyes glaze over, the judge glazes over, it's very, very hard to establish the noise claims in court with dueling consultants. I'm watching this happen in Michigan right now. It will take years to litigate. You can say, look, we can avoid all of that. We're going to use our physical setbacks as a proxy for noise because anybody can measure a mile and a quarter and say the term is a mile and a quarter from the house there. And you can defend that in court. You don't need to hire an army of acousticians uh, to uh, protect your community's interests. And what about property values? Mr. McCann is right. Uh, maybe setbacks of two to three miles would be in order to protect property values. I would say that it might be more reasonable to just simply set a height limit that diminishes their impact on the community in the first place so that the property values are not grossly impacted. What we did in our township is we adopted four times the height of the term of non-participants' property lines. We're down to about just under uh, 2,000 feet. And a quarter mile to participants residence with these larger setbacks reducible with a waiver. What we said was, 
if we did two different types of setbacks, one to the guy that signed a lease and one to the guy that did not, let's protect the unleased guy with large setbacks and let's give the people who want the turn small setbacks. If the wind developer wants to proceed, all he has to do is get a waiver from all the people inside that radius to make the project move forward. That brings in your principle of I had to get my consent, I had a chance to negotiate my own compensation for what the loss of amenity of my home is worth to me. Um, that might be too small of a, of a compromise, but it was effective in our community. But understand, the noise regulations typically result in much larger setbacks than just the physical setbacks because of the nature of how uh, the noise propagates. The two-stage waiver is the key. It restores every person in the community. It restores them to equal standing in their ability to negotiate with the developer for the value of their property. Right now, the only guy who has an early strong bargaining position with the wind developer is the person with the parcel they really have to have, which will only be one out of five or ten. And remember, often the guys with the leases are often absentee landowners. Not always, but they will be the first to lease. Um, so it restores that uh, bargaining power so that everybody who's bearing the impacts actually gets a chance to negotiate. Now, secondly, uh, how loud is too loud? Dr. McCunney uh, worked on the can we in the WIA paper that concluded 45 decibels, which is already low than what your ordinance has, would not cause adverse health effects. But later, he gave, he participated in a seminar where he said, look, if it's my house, I would want the noise levels to be kept at 35, something along those lines, maybe 40. Hessler, George Hessler, and I know Dr. Schumer knows probably George and David Hessler. Um, they were retained by the state of Minnesota to, again, do some work on evaluating uh, wind turbine noise impacts. Minnesota has a lot of wind. They said, look, based on the observed reaction of typical projects in the U.S., it would be advisable for any project to attempt to maintain a mean sound level of 40 decibels or less outside all residences. But even at that level, it does not mean it would be audible or completely insignificant, but it would protect the vast majority of residents. Robert Rand, another acquisition that I actually retained for my community, and looked at our ordinance with 45 decibel noise limit. They said, look, in New England, those levels and those setbacks are associated with widespread complaints, appeals to stop the noise, and illegal action. Our experience of issue with those setbacks and noise limits has borne that out. Curiously, the manufacturer through asbestos talks about areas like this community here. It says in quiet rural areas, areas of very little background noise. Um, they recommend a, a low absolute maximum uh, limit for noise, a low limit. They understand that why communities are at risk from being impacted by wind turbine noise. They also say a maximum. Sometimes ordinances will say an LEQ, like an hourly average of the noise. And the difference is this. Um, if you get pulled over on I-94 doing 87, your defense to the police officer can't be, if you average my speed over the last hour, officer, you know I was only doing 70. That doesn't work. The um, maximum limit is exactly like that. 76 to 75 is actionable. One of the reasons it's important, and Dr. Schulmer again would know much more about this than me, when you use an LEQ measurement, an average measurement, you can record 25 dBA of noise, which is really low, for 59 minutes on an hour. And have one car drive by producing 65 decibels of noise for only one minute. That just raised your hourly average to 47 decibels. And they would say, well, our turbines are only going to make 45 or 48 decibels, and your average noise in your ground here is 47 decibels. He said 59 out of 60 minutes, it may only be 25. You may want to say, well, but if the wind's blowing hard enough to turn the turbine, then your ambient noise level would be louder. And I would say, not always. Often the winds can be very calm on the surface, and the wind's lofter enough to turn the turbine. Secondly, often you are sitting on a protected patio or something where you're not getting a lot of ambient noise, but you can hear the turbine noise. It really depends. We have the 40 decibel nighttime noise over the non participating property lines. Again, this is a political document that was compromised. We did 45 daytime noise limits. That's a very strong position in court. Why did you lower it at night? It turns out that's when most people sleep, Your Honor. That's why we wanted to protect people at their most vulnerable time. We did something else, however. Uh, we added this DBC limit. DBC includes a lot more of the low frequency energy. And we put a 55 DBC limit. Um, we see that was a pretty uh, good compromise with terms of what the developers wanted and what the uh, people wanted. Uh, people always say, did they build turbines in your community? No, they did not. They decided they were not interesting, interested in offering compensation and earning the consent of all the people that were 
going to have empirical effects. That 55 dB signal noise limit is probably going to be something a mile or more uh, for low frequency noise protection. That's why I say we can get hung up on the physical setback, but the noise limits are often a much larger number than that physical setback number. Shadow flicker, Mike already nailed it. They have a, uh, a detection system now. You can, I think, remember, you're always going to have to make some kind of compromise between what your tolerance for litigation uh, from a developer versus what is still enough to protect your people. Um, so nobody really likes to ever say zero shadow flicker because that's always a harder position to defend in court. But with this new soft, that's what our attorney told us in, in Ryan Township. I would say here that the um, Software sensor package technology is available out there now. It's much easier for them to accommodate very low power limits for uh, shadow flicker. Think about it, 30 hours per year shadow flicker, how do you measure that? Does somebody stand in each home for an entire year and measure the flicker? And if you did that for a year with a video camera and send it in, then the next year they say, well, we'll send our guy out to verify that. You know, I mean, it's, it's virtually unenforceable. Decommissioning matters. I don't recall seeing anything in your ordinance about requiring decommissioning bonds. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, wind developers will often tell you that you don't need any decommissioning money in your ordinance because the value of the scrap is enough to pay for the removal in the future. And I would say, well, then why are they still standing in Hawaii? If the scrap money is enough to pay for it, they do not it. I recommend that the communities adopt a decommissioning bond requirement with a value set by an independent uh, third party and paid for by the wind developers. They will often recommend a financial guarantee instead of a bond. There's a problem with that, and the wind turbine projects change ownership a lot. I can't say that I know that NextEra regularly sells their projects, many developers do, but NextEra did publish this report that shows that the vast majority of the value um, in the first 10 years of the project is um, from the tax benefits and not the cash benefits. And what we're seeing happen is that when the tax value has run out, they will flip the project to another uh, uh, operator. My point is, the people you're dealing with today in your community, there's a very strong chance that the decommissioning guy will no longer own the project. Um, if you look up a phrase called the Minnesota flip, you'll see that that's a financing mechanism whereby a small guy gets it started, a large guy takes over after the tax value is extracted and the ownership reverts back. So right now, most land use changes are pretty benign. Minimum lot sizes, sign ordinances, etc. Wind turbines are not a small change in impact. We felt the change to land use policy was so massive and the impact so profound that they should not occur without consent of all the people impacted. Right now, your community is, has been given an ordinance that basically awards the wind developer an opportunity to do as he wishes inside those guidelines, and nobody has any say anymore except through the political process. We felt with changes that large that we should be able to make an ordinance that restores people's bargaining power on the site for themselves. Um, two state setbacks with a waiver for both noise and distance require the developer to negotiate with everybody that's fair and equitable and has a chance to reduce community division. Remember, nobody's ever come to your community and said, the light coming through my windows is too steady, could you make it flicker? Nobody ever said the nighttime noise level is too quiet, could you raise it to 55 from 25? My property values are too stable. Could you build some 50 story industrial machines next door to put that value at risk? Or our horizons remain largely unchanged from the dawn of time. Could we do something about that? Nobody's ever come in and asked for that. The bottom line of something is this we were here first. We get to decide. Only two types of wind ordinances one that essentially awards free safety and nuisance easements across non participating properties, which, in my opinion, is your present one does or one that restores that negotiating value to everybody affected. And everybody say, here's what my loss of amenity is worth to me. They prefer to force the board to make that hard decision of yes or no for the entire community. Um, my version is only will restore everybody's negotiating rights. I will tell you, people say, well, don't we, how do we know what most people in your community think about wind energy? Well, in Michigan, we have a lot of township level levels only referendum where an ordinance was written to permit turbines, we have the right to put that on the ballot in front of the people. Every time that's happened in the state of Michigan, and I've been involved in a number of these, the, the people who want strong protective zoning prevail, usually from 55 to 71 percent. The wind is decidedly unpopular at the township level when people have a chance to vote. 
Finally, one last word about setbacks. You may think about 2,000 feet is bigger than the 1,300 in Michigan. Isn't that enough to make most of the difference? These are 390 foot turbines. Here's what the one looks like at 1,400 feet. Here's the one at 2,100. Here's the one at 3,100. Here's the one at 3,900. I was in uh, the Thumb of Michigan. You know, we all have our portable map <laughs> in Michigan. And I was there one night with some people, and I said, well, the red lights I see over on the horizon there, is that the development? And I'll believe they said, yes, it is. I said, well, that 1415 miles, these flashing red lights, they said, no, it's 38 miles. 38 miles. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going to see here if the project moves forward. It has a substantial impact. <coughs>